through each line one at a time, point by point. Um, we, we only put the basics in place <coughs> so we could make certain points that connected with what we were going to share this weekend. So there's one, one way mark in each of these reform movements that I want to put into our understanding that you have to, you have to understand to, to have a chance to follow where we're going. You think it'll work after it's inside? Of course, they start with the time and the end. We know that <laughs> message ultimately gets formulated. The message is empowered when the divine symbol comes down. Then you'll see the activities of the enemies. Everyone with me so far? And then the third primary way mark comes in, which emphasizes judgment. And after judgment, you'll see a disappointment illustrated. And it's in this area here that we haven't spent very much time. I put it up here, work and backsliding. After the disappointment in each of these histories, there is a specific work given that you, is marked in um, each of the histories. Um, in the history of the three decrees, they still had to finish building the streets and the walls. Um, after 1844, the Millerites were to come to understand the Sabbath and the three angels' message and proclaim that to the world. Um, in the, in after the cross, the disciples were to carry the message of the resurrection. So you'll see this work illustrated in all of these reform movements, but invariably after the work, God's people quit doing the work. That's why I have backsliding up here, which I'm just going to do this way. And ultimately, at once God's people get into this backsliding condi condition, then the fourth way mark will arrive, which in the time of Christ was Pentecost. In the time of Moses was Pentecost. Um, in the time of the three decrees was the work of Nehemiah. And in our time period, it's the the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, but, but some of these histories, such as the, our history, which begins back in the Millerite time period, and then you know, 150 some years later, we're down here, more than that, 160 some years later, we're down here at the end of the, their reform line. Because this is the Millerite time period, this is the end of that reform period down here with us. Some of them cover a long period of time, but some of those reform movements don't. For instance, with Moses and Christ, Passover and the cross took place on the identical day of the year. And Pentecost is identifying that Pentecost came 50 days after that. That's what, what the word Pentecost comes from, is 50 days. 50 days after the cross is when Pentecost comes. So, what I'm saying, the, the prophetic illustration that, that you will find in these reform lines in the, for instance, in the story of Christ, the prophetic fulfillment of the work and the backslidden condition, it's not so striking because it takes place in a short period of time, but it's there, okay? For instance, in the three, maybe you'll see what I mean in a moment. When they, when they come out of uh, Egypt, the work they're given to do is to gather manna, but they, they don't follow the directions on the manna, okay? So they, they quit doing the instructions. Um, when the, the children of Israel came out of Babylon to rebuild the city, after the third decree they took up the work, but inspiration tells us shortly thereafter they got preoccupied with building their own homes and taking care of themselves. And the Lord had to raise up Nehemiah to come back and get them refocused on their work. There's always this break in the continuity of the work. Do you follow me? Okay, that's because the the pr the the inference of the backslidden condition in the time of Christ, it's it's the weakest, if you would, because after the cross, the disciples were dis disappointed, and they were to carry the message of the cross and the resurrection to the world. That was their work, but the backslidden condition of the disciples is illustrated 
when they went fishing. Okay? When they went fishing, Christ comes to them and reminds them that he called them to be fishers of men, not fisher of fish. So why am I, why am I telling you that? Because you, you need to understand that in the, the history of Christ, this backslidden um, waymark that's illustrated upon the testimony of way more than two or three in these reform movements, um, that this is when it took place. And even though it seems, you know, a little, you know, why, why would you call the disciples going fishing backslidden? That was pretty much most of their profession. And it doesn't, fishing isn't necessarily sin, is it? So I just want you to see that. You'll see why in a moment. In fact, if you don't get that point, if there's one point that typically becomes a little bit difficult to follow in this presentation, it's that point, okay? But we're, we're working to try to make sure that we get it. Turn with me to number to page 87 of your notes and at the same time to Revelation chapter 8. Now, I haven't quite did one thing in this presentation that all the t other times I've tried to do this presentation, I spend a great deal of time to try to get in our minds and I, I'm going to say it here quickly so at least I have it in the record. When it comes to the seven churches one of the things that we can understand easily from the seven churches is that in the story of the seven churches there are several different lines of truth. All right, But they, none of them destroy the other lines of truth. When John recorded the message to the seven churches those messages were for seven churches that actually existed and he sent those letters to those seven churches those were actually messages to churches that were there and then existing so that's one way that's one truth connected with the messages to the seven churches another line of truth is that we understand these seven churches represent the history of the Christian church from the time of the disciples to the end of the world that's a second line of truth but it doesn't destroy the first line of truth Sister White takes the messages of these seven churches and she applies them to individual Adventist Christians in the testimonies. She'll take the, the counsel from Pergamos and, and, uh, and she has taken the counsel to Pergamos and wrote a testimony to brother, brother so-and-so and used that message. So the message to the seven churches has prophetically also been used to give an individual message. So that's a third way that it is accurately applied. You follow me? She also, you, if you look closely at her writings, she also takes the messages to these churches and she's applied them in a general sense to the church at large. Not just, not just members of the church, but the church. So there's a fourth line. Point being is, the seals repeat and enlarge upon the churches and the trumpets repeat and enlarge upon the seals and the churches. So each of these lines, whether it's the churches, the seals, or the trumpets, we should expect to see more than one line of truth connected to them. And the reason I'm saying that is we understand, I'm a po I, I agree and accept and teach the pioneer understanding of the seals. Okay, they, they mark that this first seal is the history, the, the parallels Ephesus, second seal parallels Smyrna. I agree with that. But I want to, I'm going to suggest something here that the pioneers didn't teach about the seals and I just want to make the argument that I'm not, I'm not denying what the pioneers taught about the seals. Another understanding from the seals does not destroy that initial understanding any more than two or three different understandings about the churches destroy each other. Okay, so without denying the historical application of the, the seven seals, I want to remind you that early on I, I looked for a James White quote and couldn't find it and then shortly thereafter at one of the presentations I brought that James White quote in and read it out of a magazine and put it into the record and what the point I was making about that that James what James White said is James White identified that 
in Revelation 5 when Christ takes the book that's sealed with seven seals and he begins to remove the seals one at a time throughout the rest of the book of Revelation that James White also says that as he's removing that first seal there in Revelation that is also him removing the seal from the book of Daniel in 1798. So James White is saying that in 1798 the time of the end for the Millerites that the book of Daniel was unsealed but when the book of Daniel was unsealed when that's illustrated in the book of Revelation the way that it's illustration, illustrated in Revelation is that it's the lion of the tribe of Judah that is unsealing the book of Daniel and in Revelation it's portrayed as a progressive unsealing the progression is represented by the fact that he removes seven seals one at a time progressively so there's the other line of truth that you can see with that approach to the seals is that the seals, the, the removing of the seven seals one at a time, one, two, three, four, five, is identifying a progressive development of truth that begins at the time of the end in 1798. And the message for that history is fully opened here at the end of that history. Okay, so Sister White says in in eight, she doesn't say it this way, but I'm just I'm perfectly representing what she says. In 1844, the Book of Daniel is fully opened. Okay, here it's getting open; it's being unsealed. But by the time the seventh seal is removed in 1844, it is fully open. So, another line of truth with the seven seals is it's re representing a work that is accomplished by the Lion of the Tribe of Judah. And he accomplishes this work in every reform movement. Because every reform movement, and we've shown that to you more than once, we've identified it, at the beginning of every reform movement there's a prophecy that's fulfilled and with the fulfillment of that prophecy there is light shed upon this coming generation. That light tests that generation. But who is it that is responsible for opening that light up? The line of the tribe of Judah, Christ. And in Revelation when it's describing his work in opening the sealed book to God's people it's portrayed as a removal of seven seals from the from the Bible okay so I'm saying that one of the w works that Christ does as the high priest is he's the one that unseals the seven thunders in our day and age um, in the time period when the seven thunders are opened up to the 144,000. In that sense, I'm also saying <laughs> that in the time of the end for the 144,000, whenever that arrives, that the line of the tribe of Judah, Christ, he's going to unseal the seven thunders. But based on these other prophetic lines, we know that, that this prophetic light, it's going to be an increasing development of light. It's going to be a progressive unsealing, right? One seal at a time. For the Millerites, the first seal is removed in 1798 in terms of what he's doing to open light up to them. Then he removes the second seal, the third seal, fourth seal. By the time you get to 1844, seven seals removed. That, that history, Sister White plainly says, that history where he opens these seven seals is represented by what? Seven thunders. Okay. So I, I don't know if it's too much of a stretch to say that in that history when he's removing those seven seals, that they're the seven thunders. But what I am saying is that in our history, when we reach the time of the end, he will do the identical work and it will be the opening of the seven seals or maybe even the seven thunders because the seven thunders is this history too. So that being said, in Revelation 8, it says, and when he had opened the seventh seal, and that's what we're going to begin to discuss is what does it mean that he, when he opens the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour. And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having, golden, having a golden censer. And there was given to him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the, of the altar 
and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunders and lightnings and an earthquake what I'm what I'm going to identify as being illustrated here is Christ's intercessory work that this is his work as the lion of the tribe of Judah for one thing but as our high priest for another and there are several characteristics several prophetic things in this passage connected with his work of intercession that are worth noting what we're ultimately pointing for pointing out purposely or in directing our attention to is what does it mean when he opens the seventh seal but he also when he's opening this seal you see seven trumpets or seven angels with seven trumpets getting ready to sound and you see that you hear silent or you hear silent silence for a half an hour is acknowledged and you see um, prayers ascending in the smoke and you see fire cast to the earth so we want to touch on some of those things um, but we want to place it in the context is this, uh, as this being an illustration of the intercessory work that he is doing in the heavenly sanctuary and primarily we want to get to the point to where we have some information about what is represented when the seventh seal is open so on page 87 Testimonies to Ministers, Volume 9, page 267. Sister White says, The fifth chapter of Revelation needs to be closely studied. It is of great importance to those who shall act a part in the work of God for these last days. There are some who are deceived. They do not realize what's coming on the earth. And the fifth chapter of Revelation is where we see John weeping much because no man was able to open the book that was sealed with seven seal. But one of the elders told John to weep not. The lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book. And the lion of the tribe of Judah is Christ. And um, when, as soon as that statement is made, then John is, he sees a lamb as if it was, has been slain. And uh, from this point on in Revelation, Jesus begins to remove the seals from the Bible one at a time. This activity of Christ as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Sister White here is telling us that we need to closely study. All right? It is of great importance to us here in the last days. So the silence in heaven, there is, there's, of course, this is one of the, the you know, prophetic issues in Adventism from the very beginning that Adventists have discussed what is the silence in heaven for a half an hour. And uh, we're going to read a quote here in a minute from Uriah Smith where he does a really good job to say, we really don't know. The best we can do is take a shot at it and say this is what it could be, but we're not saying that this is airtight. Um, so we're going we're gonna to discuss that common understanding in Adventism. Um, but then we're going to give you, uh, uh, as Uriah Smith does, just a thought on what else it may be. I'm not dogmatic on the silence in heaven, but Uriah Smith says, on page 476 of Thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. The series of seven seals is here resumed and concluded. The sixth chapter closed with the events of the sixth seal, and the eighth commences with the opening of the seventh seal. Hence, the seventh chapter stands parenthetically between the sixth and seventh seals, from which it appears that the sealing work of that chapter belongs to the sixth seal. Silence in heaven. Concerning the cause of this silence, only conjecture can be offered. A conjecture, however, which is supported by the events of the sixth seal. That seal does not bring us to the second advent, although it embraces events that transpire in close connection with it. It introduces the fearful commotions of the elements describing as, described as the rolling of the heavens together as a scroll caused by the voice of God, the breaking up of the surface of the earth, and the confession on the part of the wicked that the great day of God's wrath has come. There are doubtless in momentary expectation, they are doubtless in momentary expectation of seeing the king appear in to them an unendurable glory. But the seal stops just short of the, uh, that event. The personal appearing of Christ must therefore be allotted to the next seal. But when the Lord appears, he comes with all the holy angels with him. Matthew 25, 31. And when all the heavenly harpers leave the courts above to come down with their divine Lord, as he descend, descends to gather the fruit of his redeeming work, will there not be silence in heaven? That's... that's one of the primary arguments of this understanding if Jesus brings all the angels with him at the second coming then heaven's empty so there is silence in heaven okay the length of the period of silence if we consider 
in prophetic time would it be about seven days and then coupled with this in advent history is this quote from sister white we all entered the cloud together at the second coming of christ and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass when jesus brought the crowns and with his own right hand placed them on our heads he gave us harps of gold and palms of victory so the logic here is if if christ sends an angel from heaven right now to be in this meeting right now how long does it take the angel to get here <laughs> does it <laughs> You think they, they're here instantaneously, right? The, the, uh, they, when an angel is sent, he's here. Correct? All right. So the, so the argument here that, that is made by some, and I'm not supporting this argument, I'm just laying it out for you, is that for them to come from heaven to earth, instantaneous. Okay. The ha silence in half hour is this seven days that it takes for us to ascend to the sea of glass and then the angels are back in heaven the problem with that prophetically is that we know that in 1844 prophetic time ended all right so we're we're suddenly um dealing with prophetic time here which if you're in the realm of adventism today dealing with prophecy then you and you're doing it correctly then you're running into people that are trying to reapply prophetic time and if you're doing your job right you're opposing them for all the right reasons and <laughs> you don't want to, you know, if that's the case, then please explain to me at that point at the second coming of Christ, if we've reverted to prophetic time, is the thousand year millennium a thousand years or is it 360,000 years? It's a thousand years. So yeah, th that's the dilemma, all right? And, and, and that's what, that's what your, your eyes miss wasn't making a claim. He says conjecture is the best that we can offer here, all right? But you can't touch this because this has been a discussion. You can't touch this without mentioning that because this is the, the discussion in Adventism that you are probably aware of. All right? Um, what doesn't matter in the Word of God? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, you're right. So I. Uh, it, may, it probably matters, but I don't know exactly why myself, okay? What I do know, all right, what I, what I do believe on the next page is a, a different approach to the silence in heaven. But I'm, in a, I'm standing on this one like Uriah Smith, all right? If you want to say, no, this is a bunch of foolishness, I'm not going to argue with you on this one. I just, I don't have the comfort level to say this is it, but I'm still going to address it. The cross, Ephesus, the desire <laughs> of ages, 693. Speaking of the cross, you'll see in the, the center of that paragraph that at the cross, there was silence in heaven. You see that in the center of that quote? Okay, in the next um, quote, it says, Jesus, from Signs of the Times, Jesus was the world's redeemer, possessed heaven's activity, heaven's ambi ambition. He longed to extend his kingdom to all parts of the world. He endured the agony of the cross to accomplish this, cheered by the prospect of a universal triumph. In dying for the sinful race, he destroyed him who had the power of death. The blood of the cross sealed the irre irre irrevocable covenant which ensures to our Redeemer the heathen for his inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for his possession. What I'm suggesting is that the, the, the primary sacred movements in connection with the covenant, which the cross is one of them, that there is silence in heaven at the cross. This was such an important um, event in terms of the covenant that Christ was making with his people that the only thing an angel could do at that time was silently look on. Okay, And, and I'm, uh, what I'm saying is that there's other events that are connected to this everlasting covenant that have perhaps not the same interest level as the cross but they have a, a similar importance and in many of those events we will find that there is silence associated with those events the day of atonement the next quote ministry of healing the, the part speaking of the day of the atonement the last sentence that's highlighted there the last two sentences says throughout the courts on the day of atonement throughout the courts of the temple every sound was hushed no priest ministered at the altars the host of worshipers bowed in silent awe offered their petitions for God God's mercy 
the, the atonement, which is part of the covenant, it's been identified that there is silence there. In fact, in our last presentation, I believe, um, in Zechariah 2, and I don't remember the verse, it's the last verse of Zechariah 2, when it says, the Lord is raised up out of his holy temple, let all the earth keep silent. This is when he's moving into the most holy place. This is a covenant issue, covenant event, and there's silence there. Okay, the second coming of Christ, um, great controversy, six forty one, um, cutting, the, the, going to the very quote out of the 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 sixth plague, who shall be able to stand? The angel's song is hushed, and there is a period of awful silence. Then the voice of Jesus is heard saying, my grace is sufficient for you. So, uh, all I'm saying is, I don't know for sure what the silence in heaven for a half hour is, but it very well could be that at each of these major, sacred, historical events that are part of the covenant, that heaven stops in reverence and awe, but also from interest. You know, who, how could an angel... Uh, be distracted with doing something else when Christ was moving from the holy place to the most holy place in 1844. You know, it's, how could they be doing something else other than watching the cross? That that's my point. Don't know what it. Don't not sure what it is. But when he opens the seventh seal, something's taking place that is so significant that perhaps it causes the angels to stop and watch in reverent awe. Next page. Incense, prayer, fire, the golden altar. Incense, pretty simple one for Seventh-day Adventists, patriarchs and prophets. The incense ascending with the prayers of the saints represents the merits and intercession of Christ. So when I'm suggesting that Revelation 8 verses 1 through 5 is a description of Christ's intercessory work, um, this is right in line with that. These uh, prayers... Um, the smoke of the incense that represent the prayers of the saints are also representing that they are being mixed with the righteousness of Christ, his merits, um, which is imputed to his people. Um, underneath that, under prayer from Second Chronicles 7.14, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my fi face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal, heal, heal their land. In the intercessory scene in Revelation 8, what we're going to suggest to you that what Christ is illustrating is his work in the sanctuary as the high priest in responding to the prayers of his people but specifically in responding to the prayers of his people at a point when he pours his spirit out upon them. And I would suggest that at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost or the midnight cry of 1844 or at the latter rain time period when Christ is pouring his spirit out upon his people, that too would be such a sacred historical event that you might see silence in heaven for half an hour. For certain, when he does pour out his Holy Spirit out his, on his people, whether it's at Pentecost or the midnight cry or the latter rain, it's only poured out upon the people when they do what? When they pray. That's what we just read in Chronicles. And Zechariah 10.1 says, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 121, we have referred to more than once in these meetings. A revival of true godliness among us, and we're identifying throughout this whole weekend that this revival is the revival of the latter rain. A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow the bl his blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. That's why Brother Sam interjected here in the last meeting that we have to meet the conditions. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give His Holy Spirit to them that ask Him than our earthly parents to give good, 
gifts to their children. And then um, this is Brother Sam's chirp. Bird chirps, doesn't it? But we don't spell the chirping bird the way Brother Sam spells chirp. Brother Sam here spells chirp. How do you spell chirp? C H R E P. C H R E P. Trip. Anyway. Why does he say that? Because he says, in order to receive the Holy Spirit, there are conditions that are to be met, and they are in this paragraph in an acronym. The conditions are, it is our work by confession, C. Humiliation, H. Repentance, R. Earnest prayer, E.P. To fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant us his blessing. But here's the part I want to highlight. A revival, or... The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain need be expected only in answer to prayer. And we will only receive it if we meet the conditions which are trep or chirp. Chirp. So if this is the intercessory scene that's being illustrated in chapter 8, then one of the things that we're seeing is the prayers of God's people going up to Christ in order for him to um, receive and mix with his merits and then we also um, find that there is coal taken from the altar that is cast to the earth next quote from ye shall receive power 178 says this it was a sin in the ancient economy to offer a sacrifice upon the wrong altar or to allow incense to be kindled from a strange fire we are in danger of commingling the sacred and the common the holy fire from God is to be used with our offerings. The true altar is Christ, and the true fire is the Holy Spirit. So in this intercessory scene in Revelation 8, when the coals are taken off the, the altar and then cast to the earth, um, filled it from fire from the altar, it says, and cast it to the earth, what's being cast to the earth? The true fire is the Holy Spirit. In answer to these prayers, the Lord is pouring out His Holy Spirit at this point. And that's what I'm suggesting, is that this intercessory scene is describing Christ's mediatorial work at the time period when God's people are coming to Him in prayer and asking for Him to pour His Holy Spirit out upon them. And in response to that, He takes their prayers, the, their, the smoke of the incense, mixes it with His merits, then has an angel take the fire af off the altar and cast it to the earth. Our God is a consuming fire. Hebrews 12.29 Fire is a symbol, a symbol of purification. Review and Herald, October 16th, 1888. I don't know if any of you remember it, but early on, first presentation, second presentation on Friday, I recommended a newsletter that we have done November um, and you can get it off this website here where we give the what we believe to be the arguments necessary to justify the things that we are teaching about the latter rain and one of the things that we teach about the latter rain is that the latter rain first awakens us and it awakens us in a Laodicean condition at that point we as Laodiceans have the choice to respond to that latter rain message and bring our life into agreement with it or reject it. Um, a misconception in Adventism is that when the latter rain is poured out that it is only poured out upon people that are already fully sanctified. That is part of what happens in the process of pouring out of the latter rain. But the initial sprinkling of the latter rain, Sister White says it arouses us. Arousal is rec a word meaning we're brought to an awakening sense and then she further teaches it, it's it's the wise virgin she says um, that prepare <laughs> sometimes I can remember they pray, prepare um, for the coming crisis based once they're awake um, and, and the foolish ones don't so when the fire is poured out in response to the prayers the fire is the Holy Spirit and one of the things that the fire does is it purifies if you're already pure then it wouldn't have a work of uh, need to be accomplishing any purification. Review and Herald, October 16th, 1888. 
The live coal is a symbol of purification. If it touches the lips, no impure word will fall from them. The live coal also symbolizes the potency of the efforts of the servants of the Lord. Um, at the time period, we've, we've referenced testimonies to ministers, page 507 once or twice. And that's a passage in the Spirit of Prophecy many of us are probably a little bit familiar with where she says the latter rain will be falling on hearts all around them but they will not receive or recognize it. There is a time period in Adventism when the latter rain is sprinkling. Some people in Adventism <coughs> are receiving it and some aren't. Okay, So when this fire is being poured out which I'm suggesting is the Holy Spirit and it's being poured out to accomplish the work of purification necessary for God's people to receive the seal of God. There's two things that it does. It either purifies those people that it that want to participate in that or it works the opposite effect on those people that resist it. At the bottom well, let's read it. I in, uh, Desire of Ages 107. I indeed baptize you in water unto repentance, said John, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The prophet Isaiah had decided that the Lord would cleanse his people from their iniquities by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. The word of the Lord to Israel was, I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy sin. To sin, wherever found, our God is a consuming fire. In all who submit to his power, the Spirit of God will consume sin. But if men cling to sin, they become identified with it. Then the glory of God, which destroys sin, must destroy them. Jacob, after his night of wrestling with the angel, exclaimed, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Jacob had been guilty of great sin in his conduct toward Esau. But he had repented. His transgression had been forgiven and his sin purged. Therefore he could endure the revelation of God's presence. But wherever men came before God while willfully cherishing sin, they were destroyed. At the second advent of Christ, the wicked shall be consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed with the brightness of his coming. The light of the glory of God, which imparts life to the righteous, will slay the wicked. So in Christ's intercessory work, he is not simply pouring his Holy Spirit out upon those people that are going to be raised up and give the final warning message. But this is also judgment against those people that aren't going to receive it. Romans 12, 19 and 20. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Now, there's some of you that are having a hard time staying awake here, all right? And we're, at, we're heading towards a conclusion here that I know from the few times that I've tried to share this conclusion, it's hard enough to um, deal with or conceptualize, take in. Um, do you need that? Um, is it flooding the floor? Um, it's hard enough to take in when we're awake. It's much more difficult if we're asleep. Okay. And, and I'm not talking about spiritually. I'm talking about some of you that are physically <laughs> closing your eyes. All right. In this intercessory scene, there's an altar, all right? Yeah, we, we can stand up if it's that bad for all of us. Everyone up, take a deep breath. There was a time, long time ago, when uh, I had so many tickets here in California that in order to save myself some money, I went to a, one of these driving schools. And uh, man, it's hard to stay awake and listen to something when you're tired. And I can, I can still remember trying to stay awake at that driving school because the guy had informed me, you know, you, if you're sleeping, you've got to come back again. And it's the worst <laughs> thing to do... <laughs> 
the worst thing to do is try to stay awake when when you're going to sleep and uh, um, we're almost to the end of the day so hang in there if you can um, so anyway if we go back back to page 89 Revela at the top of the page, Revelation 8, 3 through 5 says, And another angel come and came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of heaven. So, the, uh, we'll go back to the next page where we just left from, these prayers are put on the altar and from ye shall receive power we already read the quote previously but this sentence out of the quote we read says the true altar is Christ this is um, what this intercessory scene is built upon is the altar of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit is to illuminate Christ when the Holy Spirit is power poured out upon you and I should we meet the conditions what will be accomplished is that Christ will be illuminated in us. His character will be perfectly reflected. Introduction to the Great Controversy, page 7 says, Yet the fact that God has revealed His will to men through His Word has not rendered needless the continued presence of the guiding of the Holy Spirit. On the contrary, the Spirit was promised by our Savior to open the Word to His servants, to illuminate and apply its teachings. And since it was the Spirit of God that inspired the Bible, it is impossible that the teaching of the Spirit should ever be contrary to that of the Word. Testimonies to Ministers, page 112 says, God's Spirit has illuminated every page of the Holy Writ. If God's Spirit is poured out upon you and I, we will be illuminated. The, one of the classic illustrations of that is the fact that Sister White says, Daniel 3 it represents the Sunday law. She says it at least 11 different times. And in Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fl flaming fire furnace, which represents the Sunday law crisis. And there appeared Christ with them. He was illuminated. And they were illuminated with the presence of Christ in that crisis, identifying that in the Sunday law crisis, when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon God's people, they, the Holy Spirit will illuminate Christ to the world. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit being poured out. One of the purposes of being poured out upon his people. Um, so what I'm saying, I've given you some components. I left out the seven trumpets. I did it on purpose. It's a bigger issue. I, I wanted to put some of the... I wanted to give just some thoughts about what I'm suggesting Revelation 8, 1 through 5 is. And the, the, here's my thoughts. Okay? Is that... It, when Christ is opening the seventh seal there in Revelation 8, primarily it's describing his work of intercession. But primarily it's identifying his work of intercession at periods of time when the Holy Spirit is being poured out upon his people. But the Holy Spirit is only poured out upon his people when they meet the conditions of prayer. They have to ask for the Lord to give them the latter rain in the time of the latter rain. Um, the three primary histories that inspiration, and brothers and sisters, if you start looking closely, you'll find Sister White uses these three histories m many times. The three primary histories that Sister White often refers to to illustrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is Pentecost, the Millerite history, 1840-44, to 44, and of course Revelation 18. Those are the three histories that inspiration uses together to try to teach us about what it what happens in the latter rain time period. We've, we've often in this weekend went to Great Controversy 611 where she mentions all three of those, right? So what I'm saying is in those three histories where you find the Holy Spirit being poured out in each of those three histories that the illustration of what Christ is doing in that time period in the sanctuary when <coughs> the Spirit is being poured out is what's being illustrated in Revelation 8 verses 1 through 5. Now, we're going to look at some of those histories. The first one we'll look at is um, Pentecost. We know the Holy Spirit was poured out in Pentecost, right? Um, and Pentecost was, was here in Ephesus, right? 
Say amen. amen. Okay, because it, we are now entering into the challenging part of this presentation, okay? <coughs> Ephesus is where the Holy Spirit is poured out. Amen? But the history of Moses is the history of Ephesus. The history of Ephesus for ancient Israel. We've, we already went through that over here. Okay? If you remember that, say amen. amen. Okay? So you have also in ancient Israel, this is ancient Israel, that's what the AI is. You have Ephesus, Thyatira, Pergamos. No, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Sardis, Philadelphia, and then you have Laodicea, right? Laodicea is the end of ancient Israel in terms of of the seven churches. It's the end of us too, correct? So when is it that ancient Israel moved from Philadelphia to Laodicea? In this history, the, the, the final history of ancient Israel was, was the beginning history for the Christian church, right? I mean, the, the end of ancient Israel takes place in Laodicea. But when is it that ancient Israel moves from Philadelphia to Laodicea. I'll show you when it is. This history here, you just admitted, was the history of Ephesus, okay? And here's, here's Jesus being baptized in the history of Ephesus. The doves coming down. Remember that? In the reform movement, this is the number one. Here's the Sanhedrin choosing that Christ should die. Here's the triumphal entry where the Holy Spirit's poured out. Here's the cross. All right. Here's the disappointment of the disciples. Here's the work given. And then the disciples go fishing. Fishing. Right? Right here, this backslidden condition, this is where the change comes in this history. Now, now th this is the hard part because I just explained Ephesus for the Christian church but that history is Laodicea for it becomes Laodicea for ancient Israel and ancient Israel moves into the Laodicean condition prophetically right here just before Pentecost did they go fishing before Pentecost? yes Pentecost is here Pentecost is where the spirit is poured out. So what I'm saying is Philadelphia Philadelphia for ancient Israel um, is in this history here. It, uh, uh, who's the messenger at this time? John the Baptist. Who does Sister White compare John the Baptist with? William Miller. When did William Miller operate? Time period of Philadelphia. This is Philadelphia for ancient Israel. But ancient Israel becomes Laodicea when the disciples go fishing based upon the prophetic model that it's this, this is marking the backslidden condition. Okay? And I know that this, I believe this is the hardest part to get. But why is it important to get it? There's, a, there's an easy argument once you kind of got it in your head the next thing I'm going to say will help you see something. I hope. Ancient Israel illustrates modern Israel, right? When is it that the Holy Spirit in the latter reign is poured out? It's poured out in Laodicea, isn't it not? So we're all, all we're saying is that Laodicea for ancient Israel is where the Holy Spirit was poured out because it was poured out at Pentecost. And by Pentecost ancient Israel had already moved into its Laodicean time period and therefore the Holy Spirit was poured out during Laodicea for ancient Israel prefiguring that the Holy Spirit would be poured out in the time period of Laodicean for modern Israel. 
Okay? So what I'm saying is, when this Holy Spirit was poured out, at this point when the Holy Spirit was poured out, that Revelation 8 verses 1 through 5 is describing that. Okay? But, if, if, we, if I had the James White art, uh, article right in front of me, and I know I have it with me in the magazines, James White argues correctly that in Revelation chapter 5, when John cries, weeps because no man is worthy to open the book, and then he's told that the lion have, of the tribe of Judah have prevailed to open the book, the next verse says that he sees what? A lamb as it has been slain. I, and James White argues correctly that the lamb, Christ, was slain at the cross, and this marks the point where he prevailed to be the lion of the tribe of Judah, given the privilege to open the book that was sealed with seven seals. Okay? Therefore, at the cross, which is before the disciples went fishing, Jesus has prevailed, and he goes, he ascends, in order to inaugurate this heavenly sanctuary. And there was a ceremony that took place when he inaugurated the heavenly sanctuary and to announce that, that that ceremony had been accomplished, what did Christ do? He poured out the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Pentecost is when the, the holy place and the sanctuary was inaugurated and the sign that that had taken place to the believers on the earth was that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them and he had prevailed to be the priest that could do that work at the cross prior to his doing that. He had taken up his intercessory work and in his intercessory work the prayers came up to him and in response to his prayers then he poured out the Spirit. Were there prayers in the history preceding Pentecost that are marked by inspiration that were identified before the Spirit was poured out? Did the disciples come together in the upper room, put away their difference, and pray? Okay, so that this Revelation 8, 1 through 5 is describing Christ's activity in the time period of Laodicea for ancient Israel when he pours out his spirit. But, here's what, now here's where we want to go with this. This is the history of ancient Israel, and these are the churches. But this is the seals. The first seal, the second seal, the third seal, the fourth seal, the fifth seal, the sixth seal. And it is in the time period here that when Christ is opening the seventh seal as he's doing in Revelation 8, 1 through 5 that he is also pouring the Holy Spirit out upon his people. See it? So Revelation 8 verses 1 through 5 says, but we've already, we're moving through this material very quickly without going to the notes because it seems as though you are following me. Is there, are you following me? Okay. So we already know that in 1798, the book of Daniel was unsealed. And according to James White, and he's correct, when the book of Daniel was unsealed, the lion of the tribe of Judah began to unseal the book that was sealed with seven seals for the Millerite people. By the time you get to 1844, the spirit is poured out in the midnight cry, right? That's an illustration of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, 1844. But in this history, once again, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven seals have been opened. In the history of the Millerites, when it reaches the point where Christ is opening the seventh seal in 1844, where the book of Daniel is fully opened, he pours his spirit out upon the Millerites. Okay? And, and, and it's interesting. I wish I had a proof text for this. This is conjecture. Okay. But it's interesting <laughs> that this history is represented by the seven thunders. 
you know, it's easy for me to see that the first seal is the first thunder, the second seal is the second thunder, this history is the seven thunders, Christ is opening the seven thunders too. Seals, we're dealing with the seals now. We started with the churches. Yeah, this is, yeah, what do you want me to do with them? I just want to make sure they're seals. Yeah, we're talking about the seals now. Seals exclusively. This is the seals for the Millerites. And, it, of course, w what I'm saying also is that in the history of the Christian church, beginning in the time of the disciples until our day and age here down in Laodicea, that there have been seven seals that have been opened. And when you get to the point in Christian history, our day and age, that you're in Laodicea, you're at the point where Christ is opening the seventh seal. And you should expect to see the latter rain poured out. And this is how we understand it. The latter rain is poured out in the time of Laodicea, which in sequentially in this, this illustration of the seals is the seventh seal. But also, as a secondary testament to that, the time of the end for the 144,000 begins in 1989. And there is a prophecy unsealed. And what's the prophecy unsealed for the 144,000? No, 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 Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the book of Daniel is open. That's correct. The, the, the Daniel 11:40 marks the the time of the end. But what's sealed up until just before the close of probation? The seven thunders. So here we're seeing the seven thunders opened up. One, two, three, four, five, and this is seals. This is seals, because the opening of light to the 144,000, it's the same work. The book of Daniel is unsealed, Daniel 11 verse 40, and Christ begins to progressively open prophetic light to his people. This has been illustrated in Revelation 5 through 8 as the opening of seven seals. Ultimately, brothers and sisters, ultimately, based upon these other lines, when you get to the point at the end of the world where Christ is opening the seventh seal, you will be in the time period when the Holy Spirit is being poured out. Correct? You see the logic? Because brothers and sisters, the fact that we're discussing this truth tells you that we've reached that time period. He's opened that. But, at that point, it is where it gets interesting. <laughs> Turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah 28. And we believe that the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. In Isaiah 28, verse 9, concerning the end of the world, it says, Whom shall he teach knowledge? What's, what's the knowledge that we're worried about at the end of the world prophetically? the increase of knowledge that begins the final reform movement of the 144,000. Who is going to understand the increase of knowledge? No, I'm, I, I would really, I, that was a statement, but that, yeah, that's right, the wise. That I was, you know, who is the, the wise? How important is it to understand that increase of knowledge based on Hosea 4.6? Destroyed from a lack of knowledge. In the midst of this, Isaiah is telling us that this message of the latter rain, the refreshing, will be taught by bringing line upon line, which is what we've been doing here. The message we've been teaching here has been being taught by bringing prophetic line upon prophetic line. You've seen that, right? We're saying that this is at least part of the latter rain message. But in Isaiah 28, 9 through 13, as the technique for teaching the latter rain message is being emphasized, in verse 12 it says this, To whom he said, and he's speaking about the Adventist church, brothers and sisters, it is the Adventist church that is the people that have been promised to be the people that receive the latter rain. Yes. 
Okay, that's what this verse is talking about. To the people that he said the promise is, I'm going to give you the refreshing. This is a direct statement to you and I. It says, to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. And it's obviously a message because there's some who refuse to hear. I'm in verse 12. This is the refreshing message, but they would not hear. But this refreshing message, what else is it? It's the rest. It's the rest. So the, the refreshing is the latter rain, but the refreshing is the rest. Uh, uh, Jeremiah 6.16, 6, we've looked at. Let's look at it one more time. 6.16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old path, where is the good way, and walk therein, and you shall find what? Rest for your souls, if you return to the foundations. 1 Corinthians 14.32 says, The spirit of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. And verse 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion. When Jeremiah is saying rest and Isaiah is saying rest, it's the same thing. And Isaiah says rest is refreshing. And Sister White says refreshing is the latter rain. And Jeremiah is saying if you return to the foundations as a Seventh-day Adventist, you're going to receive the latter rain. All right. <laughs> this is the, but the, the refreshing, the refreshing, brothers and, si brothers and sisters, is the rest and they're refreshing. You see that they're interchangeable. So if you would go to um, page 97 of your notes. 97. Under the 144,000 it says this. From Review and Herald, March 19th, 1889. John saw a lamb on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. They bore the signet of heaven. They reflected the image of God. They were full of light and the glory of the Holy One. What's the Holy Spirit do? It illuminates Christ. The, whole, the Holy Spirit is illuminating Christ through the 144,000 because it has been poured out upon them, right? If we would have the image and subscription of God upon us, we must separate ourselves from all iniquity. We must forsake every evil way and then we must trust our cases in the hands of Christ while we're working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. God will work in us to will and to do of his own good pleasure. Working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We have to participate in this work. This isn't a work that Christ accomplishes for us without our participation. Those that teach otherwise in Adventism are not teaching the gospel. And there are many that do so. We have to work out our own salvation. Creative power. Or recreation. The Lord invites his people to become workers together with him in rebuilding and reshaping character according to the true standard of moral rectitude. Through faith in Christ, we are to be recreated in his image. If you're not familiar with the 1888 message, and some, in you, some of he, you in here are not, because I've spoken with you about this subject, one of the main themes of Jones and Wagner is that when Christ speaks, the creative power that was in his word that created the worlds and brought them into existence instantaneously when he spoke is the identical creative power that's in his word that if we receive by faith will recreate his image in us. It's the identical power and Jones and Wagner dwelt upon that much. That power is in the word of God and that power is in the spirit of prophecy as well and it's the same creative power that brought the world into existence and the purpose of us receiving that power at this time is to be recreated into his image when did he bring the world into existence in the bible 
Genesis what? Right in the, be in the beginning, right? In the beginning. Creative power. Education, page 1826. The creative en energy that called the worlds into existence is in the word of God. The word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise. <laughs> Accepted by the will, received into the soul, it brings with it the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. But it's the same identical power that brought the world into existence. And this is the power that he is offering to impart to his people as he pours out his spirit upon them at this time. Because you know what he knows? He knows that this church is the Laodicean church better than we do. He knows our condition. And he re brings us to this time period and begins to sprinkle the latter rain in giving each one of us opportunity to awaken to this message and say, yes, I want to partake of that power. I want to be recreated. Brothers and sisters, the fact that this issue is coming to life here right now on this mountaintop on this weekend is, is evidence that the Lord is putting a burden upon you that you must respond to accordingly. Okay, you must. But he's willing to give that creative power through his word. Okay. Notice Education 250. The value of the Sabbath. And, and this is what you were getting at, right? You were wanting to know if the word rest in, in Jeremiah and Isaiah is the same word that's translated as Sabbath. The value of the Sabbath as a means of education is beyond estimate. Whatever our God, whatever of ours God claims from us, he returns again in rich transfigure with his own glory. The tie that he claimed from Israel was devoted to preserving among men. In its glorious beauty, the pattern of his temple in the heavens, the tokens of his presence on earth. So the portion of our time which he claims is given again to us, bearing his name and seal. It is a sign, he says, between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord, because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The Sabbath is a sign of his creative and redeeming power. It points to God as a source of life and knowledge, it recalls man's primary, primeval glory and thus witnesses to God's purpose to recreate us in his own image. What is the sign of God's recreative power? The Sabbath. What is the seal that is placed upon the 144,000? The, the Sabbath. When is that seal placed? In the time period of Laodicea. Right? Lots of good answers, but I'm searching for in the time period of Laodicea. That's when the seal is placed. And that's also the time period when the Holy Spirit is poured out. Right? Read with me, if you would, Exodus 31, verse 15 through 17 on the bottom of your page. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh it's the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord. Whoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. And in the beginning, he created the heaven and the earth. In six days. But on the seventh day, he removed the seventh seal. And he was resting and refreshing. And this is the rest and the refreshing. Jesus is illustrating that he is now removing the seventh seal in Laodicea in the time period where the Sabbath, which is the sign of the rest and the refreshing, 
is going to be the prominent issue and it's going to be the sign upon those people that have been recreated in his image through the creative power that he demonstrated in the beginning when he created the heaven and the earth in six days and on the seventh he rested. He's removing the seventh seal right now brothers and sisters. If you're at the point where you're understanding these things you're at that point. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is opening this truth up. Now this truth here doesn't have a direct connection with the role of Islam in identifying that this time period has begun. But it does. You don't have to say anything about Islam in, in this teaching here. This is, this is demonstrating what we've been dealing with all weekend long from a different point of view. Brothers and sisters, the histories that illustrate our day and age that are primarily pointed to in inspiration is the history of Pentecost, the history of the Millerite movement from 1840 to 1844, and then our day and age. And we can demonstrate that at Pentecost, we were in the time period of the opening of the seventh seal for ancient Israel. We can demonstrate, and you all understood it, even though some of you had no idea you were going to understand this kind of thing when you came here this weekend. But we can demonstrate that when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the Millerites in 1844, it was when the line of the tribe of Judah was removing the seventh seal for them. And you can understand now that we're in the time period when the seventh seal is being removed for God's people in the time period of Laodicea. And therefore, based upon his intercessory work as illustrated in Revelation 8 verses 1 through 5. He is now pouring out his creative power through his Holy Spirit upon his people. Do you realize that we've had the greatest light of any people ever, Seventh-day Adventists. And we'll be held accountable for the light that we did not take the time to understand, but there's never been a people that have had greater light than us, ever. But do you realize there's going to be people that are saved that never heard about Christ at all, never knew a thing about the Bible? Is that how you understand it? Do you really believe that there's going to be, when Jesus returns, people resurrected from death that go to heaven with Christ and don't know anything about the Bible, the spirit of prophecy or Christ? you believe that? Well, where are they going to learn these things? During the millennium, in the seventh millennium, when they are going to be sealed into a truth that before that time they did not fully understand. In the seventh millennium, there's also a re rest and a refreshing, a sealing that is accomplished upon those that have never understood the Bible or Christ or these truths. The seventh millennium is marking the Sabbath for the earth. And the Sabbath is a sign of the rest and the refreshing, paralleling the seventh day the seventh seal, the seventh thunders. We've reached the, re the end of both of our presentations in one presentation. Yeah. <laughs> you have, you have um, some notes I didn't read about the millennium about those that will be settling into the truth in the millennium. I passed over a lot. I passed over a lot on, on for the purpose that it seemed as though you were following the logic I was laying out. And I figured the more I cluttered up the logic with quotes, it might be dangerous for, for the point that I was trying to make. Brothers and sisters, the prophetic testimony about what's going on in planet Earth, the role of Islam, the efforts of the United Nations to bring in a global system, the wars, the, the earthquakes, all these what Sister White calls footsteps of an approaching God are giving evidence that we're at the end of the world. The repeat of the Millerite history is giving evidence 
that the sealing of the 144,000 is underway. And when we look closely at the history of the Christian church, the seven churches, and compare it with the rest of the biblical testimony, the history of ancient Israel, we can demonstrate that Christ is now doing the intercessory work of pouring out the latter rain upon his people. But you know something? You and I don't get the latter rain unless we come to the Lord and pray for it. And as Brother Sam's pointed out, meet the conditions of necessary to receive that. And I'd like to invite anyone who has any conviction along this line that wants to be prepared to be among the 144,000 and, and strive with all their power to be those people to stand with me as we have a, a closing prayer. I had to stand just to give our commitment to the Lord. But now I'm going to ask Brother Duane to have us kneel down and have a prayer. Loving Father in Heaven, the outcome of this is uh, what Paul says in the book of Romans. He says, while we were yet the enemies of God, uh, Christ died for us. Lord, none of us in this room deserve uh, anything uh, from heaven. But if we will uh, take to witness what we've heard here today, and some of us even in the past, uh, we will recognize uh, that it is that still small voice that speaks to us from thy word that we should be grateful for today. Lord, help us to give our hearts to thee, and that uh, we will not withhold our hearts, and that, Lord, we will pray that the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon us as a people and individually in our homes and in our lives that Lord we will not uh, be those who will be foolish but we will be wise and that we will be uh, helped by thy Holy Spirit we've asked for these blessings and we pray for them in Jesus name and Lord we want you to also uh, bless those who are traveling uh, distances short and long uh, and I know Jeff and Kathy are going to be taking a couple of different directions so please bless them and keep them safe and we uh, ask thee for these things in Jesus name Amen so so we're going to have a, a collect a little offering uh, I didn't realize that this was the last meeting but now that I realize it <laughs> I didn't either until we got here <laughs> yeah that's fine so um, we're going to have some questions, but as we have questions, I'm going to pass a box around so that you could, uh, if you want to uh, give a donation or an offering, you could make an offering. So hold on just a second so I could... Do you have... Huh? Oh, this is for Jeff. For his ministry, yeah, so it, you could, if you if you're going to do a check, future for America. So future, uh, could you put it on the board that way they can? I don't have anything better than this box, so <laughs> <laughs> it'll be this box. <laughs> no, that's too small. Too small. <laughs> so um, so we'll just pass it around. Is that okay? Yeah, fold it in. Thanks. And um, and then if you have um, Sam has a question. Yes, Sam. Uh, Revelation uh, fourteen eleven talks about uh, here are the um, the ones that have no rest day and night. Does that have anything to do with the rest that we just talked about? Yeah, I, I'm not. When I'm identifying the rest and the refreshing as the latter rain, I'm not meaning to deny the connected truth with the rest, the Sabbath rest, and the fact that the wicked have no peace. Um, and I'm certain, I'm certain that's the case. There's a quote, it may even be in our material in, in the early part, where Sister White says that I'm pretty sure it's in the material, the handout material, where Sister White says those men in Adventism that fight this, the final warning message, um, if they do so to the end, they will become as men 
that have lost their mind. Mm. So in this time period of the rest and the refreshing, um, when we're settling into the truth so that we cannot be moved, uh, those that are fighting against that very message are going to have no peace, even to the extent that they're going to become insane, some of them. Or what we could call medically insane, I would think. My question is regarding the uh, 144,000. Would you explain, uh, at least to me, because I understand it's, uh, it's not literary, it's just like the, the people living faithfully at the end. I don't know. I would like you to explain it to me, please. Okay, that takes a minute, but I'll do it if, if you wish. Um, I'll do it how I understand it. Yes. And there are some subjects in prophecy that Sister White gives us inferences that that we need to be delicate about and the hundred and forty four thousand is one of those subjects and I'm not I'm still going to answer you I'm just I'm telling you that that is one of the few places where we have counsel that um, we're not to be too dogmatic about our understanding okay but for me I believe the hundred and forty four thousand are literal sister white says a hundred and forty four thousand in number I believe also that the 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 testimony of who the 144,000 are in the Bible has spiritual applications too. I showed one here from Louis Weir. When you take the names of the 144,000, take the definitions of those names, and then place them into a statement, there it, it describes the experience of the 144,000. So in that illustration of the 144,000, there is a spiritual understanding to be gleaned from it, but the 144,000, I believe, is a literal group of people that live at the end of time. If you go to Revelation 6, I told you that it takes a little while, and I'm going to go quickly, but we have already put some place, things in place that will allow us to move quickly. In the fifth seal, in verse 9, it says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw the altars of the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? This is the martyrs of the dark ages. Okay? Uh, standard understanding in Adventism, it's correct. This is the martyrs of the 1260 years. They've asked how long until the Lord punishes the papacy for murdering them and they get the answer in verse 11 and blue robes were given to them white white robes are given to these martyrs right white robes were given to every one of them and it was said unto them that they should rest a little season until their servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were were, were should be fulfilled Rest in your graves because there's another group that are also going to be martyred by the papacy. And until that takes place, you rest in your graves. This is why, and you have the quotes in your notes, that Sister White takes this statement and she says this is fulfilled in Revelation 18. Because Revelation 18 is identifying the Sunday Law crisis that's just ahead of us, which is the time period when the second group of papal martyrs will be made up. Okay, but that, that's just one point. So in the, the fifth seal, you have a question that's raised, and the question is about the martyrs. Okay, in the sixth seal, when you get to the conclusion of the sixth seal, in verse 17 it says, of chapter 6, For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The question is, is who can stand in the time period of the seven last plagues? This is the 144,000. And Mr. White tells us the 144,000, they are those that don't taste of death. So, in the fifth seal, the sixth seal, you have two questions. The one question is concerning martyrs. The other question is concerning those people that don't die. Because immediately after this question, you have Revelation 7 where you see the 144,000. Here's the answer. Who, here's the people that can stand in the day of God's wrath. The 144,000. But in verse 9, after the 144,000 are mentioned, and of course, 
the 144,000, they were numbered. 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from that tribe. And verse 9 of Revelation 7 says, In this, after this I beheld and lo, a great number which no man could number. There's a purposeful distinction between these two groups. Of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with blue robes. Clothed with white robes. Okay. Here's the answer to the fifth seal. These white robes are representing martyrdom. Okay. And, and some people have said, I think my wife even said once at this point in this discussion, Sister White saw that the martyrs had a red border on their white garments, and she did, but the fact that John is seeing white robes doesn't say, the de just because he doesn't make details about red border doesn't mean that the white robes aren't the symbol of martyrdom, okay? So if that popped into your mind, uh, the white robes is the symbol of those in the fifth seal, and everyone acknowledges those are martyrs. It, it, it very plainly says them. These, these people have white robes. And palms in their head. Now, um, I'm not, did anyone understand that I was saying these was the 144,000? Yeah, yeah, but I'm answering her question the way I want to answer it, okay? Okay, I told you it's a little bit longer, okay? The 144,000 were numbered, the great multitude no man could number. There's a distinction. You, did, you may not be familiar with it. But Sister White says that Enoch is a symbol of the 144,000. Okay? But she also says that there have been Enochs in every age. So throughout history, there have been Enochs. But Enoch is, Enoch is a symbol of the 144,000. Therefore, throughout history, there have been people that were symbols of the 144,000. And Sister White will tell us that all those that have died from Adam onward make up the great multitude that die faithfully, okay? What I'm, the reason I'm saying that is just because we have symbols of the 144,000 and symbols of the great multitude throughout all history doesn't take away from the fact that the book of Revelation is primarily giving a statement about the very end of the world, okay? So the 144,000 are the group of people at the end of the world that stand through the seven last plagues even if Enoch was a type of the 144,000, he's not going to be there. And the, the great multitude are the, the martyrs that are made up in the second papal bloodbath, even if there are people that are part of the great multitude in a general sense. There is a great multitude at the end of the world. There is those that do not die at the end of the world. For second testimonies to this, you have the three Elijahs. The first Elijah never died. He went to heaven in a flaming chariot. The second Elijah died. His head was chopped off, John the Baptist. Those two Elijahs brought together in a triple application of prophecy are illustrating God's people at the end of the world. So God's people at the end of the world, based upon the three Elijah, will be in two groups. One group that doesn't die, the 144,000. One group that does die, the great multitude. Look at Revelation 20, verse 4. We looked at this once this weekend already. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. How did John the Baptist die? He was beheaded. And for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads. These are the martyrs during the Sunday law crisis that's just ahead. These are the ones that, are, that lose their head during the testing time of the mark and the image of the beast. Correct? Therefore, this is the second group that the martyrs in the fifth seals are resting in their graves waiting to be made up. But this second group has been prefigured by John the Baptist, the second Elijah who lost his head. But there is one other way Christians are going to die. Sister White says some of us that are faithful as Seventh-day Adventists are going to be too old to go through the crisis and there's going to be some that are too young. We're going to get laid to, to rest. Another illustration of the end of the world is the Mount of Transfiguration. And upon the Mount of Transfiguration Moses and Elijah appeared with Christ. 
and Sister Wright says this is a representation of the end of the world. Elijah represents God's people at the end of the world that don't die. Who's that? The 144,000. Moses represents God's people at the end of the world that die. But did he lose his head? He was laid to rest. So there's primarily two groups of Christians at the end of the world. One group, and this is the, this is the key, it's primarily two groups. But one of those groups has a part A and a part B. That's what I'm saying. One of those groups doesn't die. One of the groups does die. One of the areas of controversy in Adventism is, is the 144,000 a literal number? I believe it is. The, those that do die, you have those that are die, die as martyrs and those that are laid to rest from natural causes. And the other thing that I add to this, the question that often comes up, if the Sunday law would arrive in the United States tomorrow and we were all living, some of us no doubt would receive the mark of the beast and potentially some of us receive the seal of God. If, if one of us receives the seal of God at the Sunday law, that is no guarantee that we are the 144,000. The, hundred, the only thing I can show from inspiration, and, and I haven't seen anybody that can, can do otherwise, is those Christians, those people that have the seal of God, when Michael stands up and human probation is fully closed, those people that are alive with the seal of God, that is the 144,000. You could very well receive the, sun, the, the seal of God at the Sunday law, but after that be laid to rest. All we know about who the 144,000 are in terms of when they are numbered is they're the ones with the seal of God that stand when probation closes. In uh, Revelation 22:17, it says, uh, "And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come." I believe that's the the loud cry, because right after that it says, "And let him who hears say, Come." So let him who hears, I believe, are those that are coming out of Babylon, <clears throat> because they join in the loud cry. It's a swelling cry. I just wanted to add that because I, I truly believe the same as you that the 144,000 see no death and that they're the bride in that verse. But then there, there are others that are called out of Babylon that are also alive at the end, but they're not, they're not the 144,000. Yeah, Does that make sense? Is that true? My question was the 144,000 will basically be the one that are have been in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, or will there also be people coming out of Babylon joining in? That could uh, be. I understand that the 144,000, the implications are that they are Seventh-day Adventists, and, and the argument from that is one of the characteristics of, of the 144,000 is that they are the first fruits, and judgment begins with the, at, at the house of God. I would hesitate to get on board with Brother Sam because um, he's, he's applying the bride and when you get into the bride and the discussion of the bride, Sister White, uh, there's some statements that get really um, sticky in there about um, Jerusalem being the bride and therefore we can't be the bride because we're the guests and uh, I understand some of the applications of that but I, I've been in those arguments before about the bride and the guest and this isn't the place to get into that one. <laughs> Say that I, I understand your logic and I'm going to leave it at that but the implications are the 144,000 are Adventists. And then the, then the thing is, the big question is, that is, that is really difficult for people to say, but, but they say this, are you saying that everyone that comes out of Babylon gets laid to rest? Yeah, well, but it's a, it's a pretty profound thought, right? Anyway, any other questions? As I said at the beginning, this is a, this subject, 144,000, and I think these are all the things that are connected with that typical discussion are places where we have been warned to be careful because several will have their own
preconceived yeah. ideas and it can be divisive. Right, and uh, with, with what you were saying as, as far as being careful, how do we avoid you know, branding or leaving the impression on people that the 144,000 are somehow spiritually superior to others? Uh, or are they? Because I mean, everybody receives the seal of God and they're all going to go to heaven. So, I mean, the end result... Everyone gets a penny for their labor. But the 144,000, wh wh whether those that come out at the 11th hour or those that have been out in the field all day long, everyone gets a penny. So the reward is identical. Right, the reward. But for what... They just don't taste death then. Yeah, but for whatever reason, the 144,000 are called the first fruit. There's a distinction. And, and in the Feast of, of the Bible, you know, there was a first, street, first fruit offering that was brought in. And... Uh, there is room to make that distinction. Now there are fanaticisms within Adventism offshoots that, that twist that and, and portray the 144,000 as some kind of, like you're saying, spiritual s superiors. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing anything other than, than misrepresenting a truth. Um, the 144,000, if you're going to go down that line, perfectly reflect the character of Christ. And when was it that, car that Christ um, lifted himself up above anyone he was around? On the contrary, he did the opposite. No, he come all the way all down, the way down, even to the death of the cross. Yeah, when we get to heaven, there is a special place that they get to go into. Yeah. And, and, but there will be absolutely no l levels of highness or lowness. No. No. It there won't be any jealousy involved. Uh, everyone has a special work to do, but I, I agree with that. One of the things that, that in certain present presentations we do, particularly if we're doing one called the Purification of God's Church that we try to point out, is that before the Sunday Law, uh, as your burden seems to be, and, and it, well, all of our burden should be, this is the time period when what we should be doing more than anything else is sowing seeds. Okay, uh -huh. Because when the Sunday Law arrives, that's when the seeds come to maturity, the plants come to maturity. And the Sunday Law crisis is not a time for seed sowing. Everyone that comes out of Babylon during the Sunday Law crisis will have had some type of relationship with Christ before the Sunday Law crisis. The seeds have to be sown now if we're, if we're going to do our job. But the, the point is this, because of that fact, Seventh-day Adventists are held to a high, higher accountability. We're held to, to all the reform messages that have been left in the spirit of prophecy. Whereas those majority of God's people that are in the other churches, they're going to be held accountable to having some kind of experience with Christ, but not to the special reform information that has been left with us in the spirit of prophecy. When the crisis arrives, then they're going to be held accountable to exercise spiritual discernment concerning the Sabbath and Sunday. But they're not going to be held accountable to understand the history of the 1843 chart. They're not going to be held accountable for all the things that we are held accountable for. So yes, we've had greater light. We have ha we'll have a different accountability. But all we're going to get is a penny. And that's what they get is a penny. Yeah, if we get if we get our pity, where there's nothing else <laughs> better. <laughs> no. Just just complementing that her question, because when we see all this study about the refreshing, the the I know, the, early, uh, the, latter rain. the the latter rain that has a refreshing first, we're getting this message. So it's preparing a group of people that will carry this forward. Is this people only the 144, or also would be people that will go to heaven as well. You know, that they, they will receive the seal of God, but they might not be on the 144. That's right. It could yeah, be either, yeah, way. It's if either way. It's not if someone not co comes out of the Baptist or Catholic or Islam mm -hmm. once the Sunday law arrives. No, and before, and I'm saying uh, now, at the time. Uh, 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 now, uh, uh, if someone comes into this message now, before the Sunday law, I think they're going to be, 
held accountable to grow up into this message. And there's a very famous quote, I think we discussed it here once, where we, we, they will have to learn in months what it's taken some of us a number of years to learn. And the biblical illustration of that is that we are now in the harvest. And the harvest is where the plants come into fruition and they do so very rapidly. So we know that's possible. But the thing is, if, if what I understand is at a, a fairly mature level for this message, and I'm not trying to lift myself up, I'm just trying to give an illustration. If my understanding is, if what we're studying is correct, and my understanding of it is at a mature level, I'll tell you, it's taken me at least 25 years to come to this level, whereas someone could come to this meeting today, not understand what they heard, but be convicted that I want to understand this, and the materials are there where they can learn it in a couple of months. So, so I think until the Sunday Law crisis arrives, um, they will be getting on board with Adventism and be held accountable for doing likewise. Uh, look at Isaiah 28. I want to ask you a question if you've considered uh, the last portion of that chapter about the plowman and then uh, through verse 29. It says, Does the plowman plow all the day to yeah. sow? Doth he open and break the clods of his ground? When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not cast abroad the fitches and scatter the cumin and cast in the principal wheat and the appointed barley and the rye in their place? He started in 24. Yes, and at the end it says, To this, all cometh, to, to this also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts. This also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. Have you considered these last parts of the text in connection with your talks? Personally, but uh, I've never... That's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, well, what do you think? Uh, it, it seems like it's, he's illustrating that all the farm work ultimately comes together and finishes together. Right, and that this... Uh, that this... Uh, this, is, this is a... part of the parable of the sores where we have good ground. This is the establishment of where good ground is accomplished in the parable of the sower. It's not shallow ground or, or stony ground, but it's that ground in which the Lord, it says here, that this also cometh forth from the Lord of hosts, which is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. So could you consider this good ground? We hope so. <laughs> we hope yes. so. We don't want any stony ground hearers. No. We, uh, uh, okay. I've understood that the 144,000 are the people that can do as Christ did and stand without an intercessor before God and that they are the other people of us who don't go through that period of time don't have to quite meet that same standard but also the guy down at Blythe this, uh, guy named Sadie that's doing a evangelistic series believes 144,000 are uh, not literal number and he uses the idea that a lot of the other sim are things in that same area of the Bible are uh, obviously can't be taken literally because they don't make sense if they are that was his reasoning uh, for what it's worth <coughs> Yeah, I, in that subject, I hear, I hear that and similar responses uh, more than once. And I've said this more than once this weekend too. I'm probably a little bit too simple-minded, but where, where my point of reference on, on this, on that number, is the statement where Sister White says 144,000 in number. I have a hard time getting past that. But, but one, yeah, but one thing I, I think I at least partially disagree with you with. Um, I don't think that, that those people that receive the seal of God and get laid to rest or are martyrs, um, that, that, doesn't, that that means that they don't have the experience necessary to stand when there is no inter intercession for sin. They, they have to have a complete 
experience in Christ. I mean, there's a little bit of it uh, because that's, we've been told that's why some of them get laid to rest is they don't have the physical strength, perhaps the mental strength. I, I understand that, but, but I don't, I don't want to leave the thought in our mind um, that their salvation isn't the same salvation that Adam and all every saved has all the way through time. What's that? Yeah. Hold on, hold on. I don't know if I heard him correctly or not, but I think I heard him say something about something going from uh, symbolic to literal. If that was what I heard him say, because I, I heard this argument before about the 144,000 that you can't go from symbolic to literal. But if you read uh, the prophecy on <clears throat> King Nebuchadnezzar where it talked about the tree and the bands and everything, it went from symbolic to literal. So that kind of breaks that rule of thumb. How did it go from symbolic to literal? Well, it was talking about the tree pointing to Nebuchadnezzar and bands and whatnot, and then it started talking about him literally. So it went from symbolic to literal. Okay, I don't know that that's what I heard him say. He, uh, what I heard him say, but uh, it's your your comments okay. I'm not not well, I'm just it. I'm just saying I heard that argument before against the 144,000 because I believe as you that they're a literal number because there was a number and then there was a unnumerable. So oh, okay. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm in agreement with you. Yeah. But right. anyways, I heard this argument that you can't not do that, but yet they did that for Nebuchadnezzar, so that kind of breaks their argument that yes, you can do that because it's in scripture done that way already. When when we when you started this, okay, I said I, I said that uh, sister, this, this is one of the areas where Sister White at, at minimum infers that we got to be careful. One of the prophetic exceptions, one hundred forty-four thousand, and there isn't a problem going on in here, at all. But it, this subject invariably this this w can get a good good conversation going on with a group of Adventists, but sometimes I've 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 seen it get just flat. You know, device. If that's not going on, I'm just pointing out that this is part of the evidence. But I was still had a question mark in my in my head, so that's why I wanted to know what was your definition of the 144,000 according to your studies of LNG White, because you know, I you know, we have a um, a series of presentations that we do. And we, we, I don't know. I don't remember what it was. But the first presentation isn't isn't my presentation. I, where there's a friend of mine in Arkansas. He has a really nice voice. So we had him read a sermon of A. T. Jones in, and that was number one. We sent that out. Just A. T. Jones sermon. It's a it's a excellent sermon. And people people would get it, and they think you know an A. T. Jones sermon, and they'll you can tell they're really could care less. And then after they listen to it, man, they come back and say, wow, it's really that good of a sermon. And in it, it, it he's talking about how we determine what truth is and there's a point where he makes an illustration he says suppose someone comes to me and says brother Jones what do you think about this or that or this or that in the Bible and he says it doesn't matter what Jeff Pippinger thinks you need to go to the Bible and figure it out for yourself amen <laughs> he, he uh, one of the one of the things about th the thing that one of the questions that Ken brought up about whether or not th those that are laid to rest are going to have to have characters that are uh, somehow in the same fashion as those who are going to stand through the time of trouble and are the 144,000. The uh, Acts of the Apostles gives a good example of uh, what it means to come to the end of your uh, uh, life uh, and like Paul did, he died for his faith and Peter, when you read in there you'll see that uh, our characters are going to have to be rock solid rock solid, now Jacob is a type of the 144,000 but Jacob's not going to be in the, in the 144,000 as you mentioned, Enoch's not going to be there either, right? Right. but those men's characters had to be rock solid if your character isn't rock solid you're not going to be in the kingdom you will not be there. And do you think you need a rock solid character to be a martyr? You might. You do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> <laughs> you do. <laughs> yeah, that's why in the heart of Revelation, it's the loyalty is right there. Okay. 
Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> Brother Jeff, uh, it's a little different subject. When you were talking about Zechariah and the two olive branches, um, you mentioned, please correct me if I didn't understand it right, you mentioned that the two olive branches represent the Old and the New Testament. Such a white says so. Yes. But for us now, you mentioned, and please correct me, it... That's what I said. Bible, Spirit of Prophecy. It Bible, Spirit of Prophecy. Could you elaborate a little bit on that uh, for me to try to understand uh, where this idea comes from, for me to understand a little better this application? Well, it... Well, Miller Dream is a ki kind of a, a secondary argument to that, but yeah. it... It's based upon that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter, and the light that they were given came from the Old and New Testament, which Sister White, not only in connection with Zechariah, but also in the, the two witnesses in Revelation 11, when she's commenting on it, that that's the Old and New Testament. So when that history is repeated here at the end of the world, Seventh, Seventh day Adventists are not going to be held accountable to the Bible alone. They're going to be held accountable to the Bible and spirit of prophecy. In fact, the, the, that, that's what we, sometimes we don't believe that in Adventism, but that's what we teach new converts. We take them into Revelation and we say there's three characteristics of the remnant church. What is it? They keep the commandments, they have the faith of Jesus, and what else do they have? The spirit of prophecy. But somehow, sometimes after that, when we're teaching about the spirit of prophecy, we make it sound like the remnant, the 144,000, are somehow going to stand as the 144,000 and not have the spirit of prophecy. And I would submit to you that if you're not going to have the spirit of prophecy, then it, you, maybe you're not going to keep the commandments or maybe you're not going to have the faith of Jesus. You have to have all three. No. Now, when you mention that it's both the spirit of prophecy and the Bible, are you implying that they are on the same level? No, no, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying, and I've mentioned this a little bit, is that <coughs> the same, the creative power that's in the Bible is the same creative power that God exercised to create the heavens and earth. So the, the creative power that's available in the Bible for me or you to access, to be transformed in His image, is the same creative power that he created the heavens and earth in. But in the Bible, in that word, his authority is also there. That word has authority. Where, where if I read the Bible and he speaks to me saying, don't do this or do this, um, that is a command that I must follow or I'll be in disobedience. And now what I'm saying is, is when I read the spirit of prophecy, the identical creative power is in the spirit of prophecy that's in the Bible and the identical authority is there because they were both inspired by the identical spirit. Any difference between the two do you see? There's some distinctions between them, yes. Mm. What are they? Well, one was written in English, the other is written primarily in Hebrew and Greek. Okay. Um, the canon of the scriptures came to a close about 2,000 years ago, so there's, there's technical things such as that, there's historical things. Um, do, you, do you see a difference in the question of formation of doctrine? In no, other no, words, no, if, you, if you go back, if, if he yes. has this all recorded and you go through yes. this whole weekend, and I didn't do this on purpose, but it's common, uh, a common thing that I deal with, but I know I did it today, but uh, probably four or five times in this weekend, maybe more, I refer to 1 Corinthians 14, 32 and 33, which says the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets because God is not, for God is not the author of confusion. And what I have taught my understanding of that is throughout here is that the prophets never disagree with one another. So when, when we're talking about... Um, a distinction in, in, in s some level of truth or, or anything at that level. The Sister White plainly says, 
her writings never contradict the Bible. Now, the the doctrines, the 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 doctrines that make up the foundation of Adventism were doctrines that were taken right out of the Bible that are represented yes. on that chart. So the foundational truths of Adventism they were developed before the spirit of prophecy. But there isn't anything that the spirit of prophecy says that contradicts any right. of those foundations. But does uh, spirit of prophecy, specifically Ellen White, would you say that she has a formative role as far as doctrine? F formative. Um, um, as, as, pr as prophets and writers of the Bible, have a role of forming doctrine. Which writer in the Bible forms doctrine? All of them. Doctrine is a man-made Well, thing? that's what you're suggesting. No, I'm not suggesting that. Um, doctrine is teaching. Pardon me? Teaching. Teaching from well, the Bible. I, I, I thought that the definition of doctrine, and I'm not arguing with you, I thought do the definition of doctrine were truths. Yes, okay. that's what I mean. Well, see, the, the, I'm making no. a technical argument. We're probably saying the same thing, but uh, I want to yes. make this point. I believe the author of the truths of the Bible was the Holy Spirit. Yes. Holy men of old sp spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I think that same Holy Ghost yes. moves with one Ellen White. I, I do believe that the inspiration is the same, but my question is, would she have the same authority as Bible writers as far as forming doctrine or did she only confirm doctrine or biblical truths I think I already answered that oh I don't agree with Fandel's understanding of inspiration Oh, so you, you, you. I will acknowledge, and if he's recording this, I'll acknowledge it for the record. Okay. What I own, the acknowledge? only time I went to college was right after I got out of the military, and the only reason I did it is because I wanted to receive the check for going to school. Okay. <laughs> I haven't been in college, and I wasn't studying theology at that time. So if we're going to discuss these theological concepts, uh, I'll back down from from worrying about those kind of things. What I worry about is this. Are we conveying to the lay people and the, the brethren in, Advent, in the Adventist church that when I open the Bible and it gives me a command or when I open the spirit of prophecy and it gives me a command do I react to both those commands accordingly in the same fashion? Do I understand that whether I read it in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy that is the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart or not. And my position is is that it is both Bible and Spirit of Prophecy, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to me and I have to relate to it as if it's authoritative in my life and I have to be able to understand that I can claim the promise that all the commands are promises, even commands in the Spirit of Prophecy. If the Spirit of Prophecy tells me, if I'm reading it and I'm convicted, the Spirit of Prophecy says, you shouldn't be living in the city. Well that's a command and within that command is the promise that the Lord will get me out into the country. How do you apply the lesser light and the greater light in this context? Uh, John the Baptist was the lesser light. Mm -hmm. Let me, I like this, I like this answer to that one. Show me which prophet in the Bible that was equal light to Christ. Because every prophet is the lesser light in relation to Christ. Is this the context that Ellen White talks about when, when she says... No, she's talking about the spirit of prophecy in the Bible. Yes. And, the and but Could I we focus on those Earlier, two? I said, I think I already answered that. I've, what I answered is, the foundational truths of Adventism were developed in that time period, and there will be new light, Sister White says. But, but I'll remind you again what I said. All those truths were developed in the Millerite history from the two pipes of the Old and New Testament. But Sister White says there will be new light. But she says new light never contradicts old light. So in terms of you're worried about formative doctrine, um, any kind of light that comes from the spirit of prophecy will build upon the original light. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, just a last brief question. 1989, uh, are there other people, Brother Jeff, that are teaching that, if I understood it correctly, 
that the time of the end for the 144,000, as you mentioned, is 1989 on. Are there others that are teaching the same thing? Yes. Could you mention a few names? No. Oh, you can't. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I, I know. Th I, I, th are, without mentioning any names, uh -huh. is, are there any people present in this room that know other men that are teaching that the time of the end began in 1989 for the generation of the 144,000? But th those of you that could say yes. yes. If, okay, from the same group. People same group. from the same group. From, from outside of the group, anybody that you know that is teaching. Well, I'll group. even go a step further. Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone outside of the group that's identifying that all the reform movements parallel one another, and therefore all the reform movements have a time at the end, just like the Millerites do. Okay. No, he's talking about me applying it <coughs> to the time of the end, a, 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 a prophetic. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes the people in the world are wiser than the people that aren't in the world. Okay. not applying that to the correct context. Yeah, well, uh, her statement, she's talking about the writings in the Spirit of Prophecy and the writings in the Bible. Yeah. But uh, it's kind of a, uh, a moot question. The argument is, is, is trying to place the authority of the Spirit of Prophecy in a lesser position in the Bible. And I'm just, I'm, as a human being, I'm un unwilling to, to make that distinction. I do know the distinction between the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. I do know that when I go out to give a Bible study to a non-Seventh-day Adventist, that I'm, I'm not going to take the red books, I'm going to take the Bible. <laughs> all right? But at some point in that study, I'm going to lead them to understand that the remnant people of God are connected with the Spirit of Prophecy, and that that Spirit of Prophecy, if it's not authoritative in their life, they don't have the characteristics of those people that stand at the end of the world. All right. Yeah, that's a great one. That's that's awesome. The the video on time prophets. Yeah, that's a classic now. <laughs> All right, so now I need the keys. Um, so please go ahead and go to your rooms and.